Altair Basic and sell it to their very first customer, Mitz of Albuquerque, New Mexico. This is the very first computer language program for a personal computer. A major milestone uh, for us was when we were walking through Harvard Square one time and saw this popular electronics magazine. And it was kind of in a way, you know, good news, bad news. Here was someone making a computer around this chip in exactly the way that uh, Paul had talked to me and you know, we thought about what kind of software could be done for it. And it was happening without us. Um, and for all we knew, maybe they had some software people, they were just going to go charge off and do this thing. And so we, we wrote these, this company immediately and uh, offered to do a basic for them. And they thought that was interesting. They called back and said, well, you're serious? You know, we have a lot of strange people calling us. Because this article um, received immense uh, interest. I mean, the idea of a kit computer, even though there was really nothing you could do with it. I mean, there's, there's no teletype hookup in the early days. There's no software for it. All you could do is use these switches, actually, <laughs> use them here, and key things in into this front panel and you know, maybe do a little program that does things in the lights. Or actually a guy named Steve Dompier discovered that because this bus is unterminated, if you're very clever about the program you run, you can get uh, high frequency emission that can cause a radio to make interesting noises. Now eventually we did get controllers for teletypes and uh, cassette tapes and uh, uh, floppy disks, that kind of thing. But in the early days, it's pretty useless. People just bought it thinking that it would be neat to build a computer. Because we'd never had the chip, just the book from Intel, if we'd made any mistake in terms of how the instructions worked, it never, the thing never would have run. And so Paul was scheduled to fly out to Albuquerque. He decided to go get some sleep. I stayed up all night reading the book to see if we'd miscoded some of the instructions and finally decided it was all okay, punch out the paper tape, and made sure Paul got that before he went off on his plane. He wrote the bootstrap loader, that is the thing you have to key in to make this computer smart enough to know to go get data off the uh, teletype to read it into memory. He wrote that on the plane on the way out. Uh, it was actually 46 bytes, the first one. I eventually wrote one in, in 17 bytes, but anyway. Um, and he took the basic to uh, MITS. They had a machine they, they had run with uh, 6K of memory, which for them was a big, big thing, um, and loaded it up in the paper tape. The first time, for some reason, it didn't work. The second time, they loaded in, and it worked. And, of course, the simulator, it's very slow because you go through lots of instructions, do a single instruction. So actually, the real machine, even though it's such a simple little microprocessor, was faster than our PDP-10 simulator, about five times faster. And so to Paul, when it finally came up and it said, OK, uh, actually that first version said ready. Most basics, when they're, they're ready, they say ready. Later when I was squeezing bytes out, I thought, well, it's faster to print um, OK, and it's kind of a nice, friendly word. So I, I shortened it to OK a, a little later. Anyway, so it came up, said ready, and he typed in a program. You know, print 2 plus 2, it worked. He had it print out squares and sums and and things like that. And he and Ed Roberts, the head of this company, sat there and they were amazed by, you know, that this thing worked. I mean, Paul was amazed that, that our part had worked and, and Ed was amazed that his hardware worked and that here it was doing something even useful.